So today we're interviewing Professor Cowan. I'm very much looking forward to it, to see an angle from neurology and, and uh, physics on, on uh, connections with wool. So I wonder if you uh, could tell us a little bit about your work initially and maybe how it might relate to, to Bull's work. So when I was a graduate student, at, uh, well, actually, before I went to MIT, I was at Imperial College, and I started reading, um, even before I went there, I started reading Norbert Wiener's book on cybernetics. And also I, I started, uh, there was a little book called uh, Automata Studies that was published in 1956. And it had in it um, stuff about neural networks and about mm -hmm. um, uh, von Neumann uh, and other uh, mathematicians who had yeah. ideas about the brain. Yeah. And that triggered my interest in things. So I actually read uh, uh, The Laws of Thought, for example. Okay. And then I read McCulloch and Pitts' work on uh, neural networks that implemented uh, Boolean algebra and, and stuff like that. So I was... Uh, primed and I came across this uh, piece of work by the mathematician John von Neumann on how you build reliable computers from unreliable elements and uh, uh, it struck me that um, uh, there were other ways to do that than what von Neumann had done and I ended up working on that at MIT um, mm -hmm. encouraged by my supervisor who was uh, McCulloch and in fact I went from uh, working with uh, under the supervision in part of uh, Dennis Gabor, the inventor of holography, okay. who was at um, uh, Imperial College in the 50s and 60s and 70s. He, he had been a high school classmate of von Neumann and uh, Eugene Wigner, the physicist, uh, in Budapest when they were all kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, part of the amazing group of Hungarian scientists mm -hmm. who... Uh, left to Budapest, and um, through him I ended up as a graduate student at MIT with a fellowship, and I found myself working with uh, with uh, McCulloch and uh, and interacting with uh, uh, getting courses from Shannon and um, interacting with Norbert Wiener and all the things, and <laughs> I mean. <laughs> It was quite something, and I and then I had the idea that we could do better than von Neumann's work on this problem of building reliable computers from unreliable elements. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, I was a professor and chairman of a department, so and had the leisure to uh, do what I was interested in. And, uh, what age were you at the time, roughly? Oh well, I, when I became a f full professor and chairman, um, I was thirty-three. Yeah. And I actually was technically still a graduate student. I'd never bothered to get a PhD. So I took a week off at Imperial College, wrote a 100-page paper, the first paper on the statistical mechanics of large-scale brain circuits. So by the time I got to MIT as a professor, I actually had a PhD. But, but I went straight from being a gra uh, technically a graduate student to a full professor and chairman. In those days, you could do stuff like that. <laughs> And in fact, in the first month I was there, I raised, um, in those days, I raised a million dollars very quickly for to build up the uh, Committee on Mathematical Biology there. And in today's dollars, that would be something like 20 million. And, yeah. you know, it, was easy, it was much easier in those days. That this was 1967 right. to do that. And, um, and five years later, I... I, uh, I, I I ended up uh, working with a very, very smart postdoctoral fellow, Hugh Wilson, and we produced what are now known as the wilson cowan equations, which captured uh, in using uh, differential equations rather than Boolean algebra the essential structure of large-scale brain activity. So. And what did you base the derivation of those equations on? Did you do observations? Well, there was some earlier work by uh, uh, a person who was the nominal external advisor, supervisor on my thesis in London, Raymond Burl, an English engineer. He'd written a paper in 1956. It had some errors in it, and uh, so it didn't quite hit the mark, but I realized what the errors were, and uh, um, Wilson and I corrected two of them. The third error was a much more deeper problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the equations that we developed didn't have any way of dealing with uh, 
intrinsic fluctuations and noise in neural circuits in the brain, which was a big, big problem. So uh, shortly before I left MIT to go back to England, I, I was offered a grant from the U.S. Navy Office of Naval Research to do anything I wanted. I said, but I'm going back to England. He said, that's fine. Just go there. And so I had uh, five years peace and quiet back in England while I could sit and think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I formulated the beginnings of a, a correct approach to a lot of these problems. And then when I got to uh, Chicago with Hugh Wilson, we uh, wrote it all down and wrote it all up. And it turned out it was absolutely on the mark. And, but the problem was it was so uh, long, long before uh, neuroscientists and others had the ability to simulate the equations and use uh, com powerful um, computing um, in laptops. Uh, that was, this was before even mini computers, well, actually mini computers were just coming in um, uh, in their late 60s. But... Um, so it took almost four, uh, 30 years, or 30 to 40 years for the neuroscience community and others to catch up to the equations. But now everybody uses them. And they, f they work like a charm. As I mentioned mm -hmm. before, they're, they're the right equations. And if you have the right equations, it makes things a lot easier. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff we can do with these equations to begin to get uh, a, a, con a conceptual framework to understand brain activity. What's lacking in a lot of brain research is there's no framework. Mm. And we provide the framework, yes. basically. So you were mentioning you had some fascinating applications on, on interpreting what hallucinations mean? Or yeah, you... so uh, there, there was for many years a very distinguished neurologist at uh, University of Chicago uh, from Vienna, I think he was originally, Heinrich Kluver. Um, and he, um, in the 1920s, had made a study of what happens when you take peyote. And... Um, the story goes that uh, when he, he started to take the substance, he told one of his colleagues to come to his lab to make sure he was okay, and they, they, he found uh, uh, Heinrich uh, on the floor. He'd passed out. He'd taken too much of the stuff. And finally, he refined the dose down to the level where he, he didn't pass out. He could stay awake, and after the initial period of vomiting, he began to see all these patterns, and he classified the patterns that he saw into four different classes of patterns. It, uh, I had an extremely bright graduate student named Bard Ermentrout uh, join me in the late 70s, and um, I, I realized that there was an analogy between the pattern formation that occurs in brain activity and the pattern formation that occurs in uh, physical problems like, uh, for example, uh, what is called Rayleigh-Bainard convection patterns. If you heat a liquid from below um, in a saucepan, for example, a, f a fairly viscous liquid, and you, and you study it before it starts boiling at high temperatures, it, it actually starts generating convection patterns. The liquid at the bottom of the container gets uh, hot, so it, it it, it, it gets lighter, so it rises to the top. But at the top, it cools again, so it gets heavier, so it falls down again. But if you look down on the liquid, it rises and falls. There's a, a, a kind of wall of water that's rising, and then there's another wall that's falling, and, and you get a, a convection patterns. And that's essentially what generates cloud patterns in the upper atmosphere. Anyway, if you look down on it, and sometimes you see hexagonal patterns of rising and falling liquid, or sometimes um, concentric circular patterns called roll patterns. And I realized there was a neural analog of that, and that uh, we should see uh, spontaneous pattern formation in brain dynamics under uh, certain conditions where the, the balance between excitation and inhibition is broken so that there's not enough inhibition to control excitation, so the system will go unstable in patterns. And it turned out that there's, um, ultimately, it took me 30 years, but uh, 
uh, we, we found a way of uh, writing down equations that incorporated some of the facts that accumulated over from 1960 onward about the functional architecture of the visual brain and the ability of the visual brain to detect um, edges in the visual world and things like that. And it turned out we could produce um, all the different classes of hallucinatory images that, that Cleaver reported uh, and classified. He had four classes. We found a, a mathematical uh, theorem that told us uh, that there were only four kinds of patterns that the nervous system could make because of the way it was wired. Mm -hmm. And they corresponded precisely to the four classes of patterns classified by Henry Kluver, which humans have been seeing for at least 50,000 years. If you look at cave art, a large fraction of cave art uh, corresponds to these kinds of uh, patterns, periodic blob patterns, uh, zigzag line patterns, all sorts of things, either on caves or uh, what's called mobile art, uh, um, carvings on rocks, for example. There's a rock carving from 70,000 before the present from southwest Africa, which is full of zigzag patterns. And if you go into the caves, you've got lots and lots of things like blob, periodic blob patterns, for example, cup combined with pattern of pictures of horses and uh, things like that. The anthropologist that I uh, corresponded with, David Lewis Williams, particularly from South Africa, he claims that um, these patterns are not, re uh, these are paintings are not totally representational, but that they're metaphorical. Mm -hmm. They have to do with uh, the ancient, very old uh, initial beliefs about spirits and all sorts of things that... Uh, there, but so the cave art is a valuable source of um, of um, hallucinatory images. Um, you find lots and lots of spirals and um, periodic patterns, things like that. And it turns out they are uh, precisely among the classes of imagery that the the uh, the cortex, by virtue of its structure and the way it's connected, can make. So yeah. it, it's fascinating. The, it tells us that there's um, and what's really interesting is the the first person to understand in modern terms the nature of um, p pattern formation was uh, the mathematician Alan Turing. So I consider the Turing work on pattern f spontaneous pattern formation in animal coat markings like tiger stripes and leopard spots. Although the, the biologists uh, uh, don't. Um, completely understand what Turing was telling them. Uh, it's a, it, I consider it almost as important as his work on the Turing machine and computing in general. Uh, but there's a neural network analog of Turing's work on animal coat markings, and that's what we, uh, we realized and we developed all this kind of stuff. So it turns out a little mathematics, real mathematics, can go a long way if you know how to use it. And uh, recently, uh, it turned out that uh, this has led me to realize that we can use a branch of differential geometry called sub-Riemannian geometry to actually say a great deal about the functional architecture of uh, what goes on in visual cortex and probably what goes on in auditory cortex and somatosensory cortex and motor cortices. And in fact, it may be that we can uh, use this as a very generic way to think about uh, what the brain really does in different parts. So could you consider trying to mimic what's going on? Um, we could. I mean, there's a lot of um, um, buzz these days about the brain projects that uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Henry Markram, started in Europe and the similar projects in the United States and elsewhere, um, where they consider replicating the brain in silico, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, in my opinion, without a, um, a theoretical framework to uh, pose questions about mm -hmm. the brain, it's, it's a, it looks, at, at first I thought it's likely to be a colossal waste of money. Um, but one of the things about these projects is um, 
eventually they self-regulate. And in fact, Henry, there was a, a lot of uh, pushback against Henry's ideas about what to do in Europe. And uh, it, it, I think it's getting to be more sensible. And I think the same thing probably will happen in the United States as well. But what I think will happen is that um, a lot of the younger people will get financial support from these projects and they'll do sensible things in the end with it. And it won't be anything like what the originators thought that should be done. But to me, it doesn't make sense to replicate in silica, so to speak, an entire brain because it's like building a map of the world which is on the same scale as the world itself. You won't learn anything just if you have a very, very complicated network that's built from, uh, from uh, uh, silicone rather than biology. It'll still be the same sets of problems if you really replicated everything. How on earth are you going to expe uh, understand it? It might make it marginally easier to analyze, but I think people have totally underestimated the complexity of the brain. It's, the complexity is orders and orders of magnitude greater than um, any um, existing computer complexity. And it will take a very long time before the, the brain is really understood eventually. Warren Mc, uh, McCulloch used to say that there's nothing in the brain that ink may not characterize. Uh, which he meant that he, he considered uh, everything that goes on in the brain ultimately will be understood scientifically. And I believe that strongly, but I believe that actually uh, a theoretical approach is really vital there, just as it proved to be vital in the development of our understanding of physics and chemistry mm -hmm. as well. Biology is a lot harder than physics and chemistry, and it will take a lot longer to understand, but it, eventually it, it will be. Honest. And then the social sciences are even harder than the biological sciences, and they'll take still longer to understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting view because at the moment, from my perspective, the current is against theoretical research. Not not openly against, but more focused on applicable. Well, that's because uh, most people are dumb. They don't understand. Uh, again, uh, Dirac uh, uh, gave the perfect answer. He said, uh, if you get the right equation, everything else follows. And, uh, and well, of course, he was biased because he was such a superb theorist. But nonetheless, he was the person who really understood mm -hmm. Insofar as one can really understand quantum mechanics, he understood. It. But I, I also, I used to spend summers at the Aspen Center for Theoretical Physics, and from time to time I would have lunch mm -hmm. with Dick Feynman there, and I got to know Mary Gelman very well there. But Feynman, <laughs> he was uh, amazing. He, he had a, an amazing facility of. Um, uh, he would ask me what I was doing. I'd start to tell him, and within half a minute he was telling me what I was doing and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, I once asked him why he never had any graduate students. He had maybe just one graduate student. And he said, well, students at Caltech would come to him and ask for a thesis project. And he would, he would just say, well, here's a little problem you can work on. Come back in two weeks with the answer and we'll see. And then he would go and work on it. And most of the time he could solve the problem in 15 minutes. And, but then some other problems he'd given the students he, he couldn't solve in, uh, uh, quickly. So eventually they, uh, nobody really came back with an answer or anything. So he figured out that uh, if it was a problem that he could solve, uh, it, that they could solve, he could do it in 15 minutes. And if it's a, if it's a problem he couldn't solve, they were never, ever going to get it. So he said he never had any students. But there was a twinkle in his eye when he told me that story. I wasn't sure it was true, but knowing him, it was probably true. And, uh, yeah. I, I mean, he was really smart and, f mm. and so quick. I mean. But it was very amusing. I gave a colloquium once, a, a physics colloquium at Caltech. Feynman and Ari Gelman are sitting together. Um, one of them was pretending to read the New York Times. And the other one was pretending to sleep. 
And I had to keep saying, wake up, Murray, all the time while he was pretending to sleep. But eventually they started listening to the talk. <laughs> but, and every speaker at, Cal at Caltech Physics had to go through this uh, ordeal. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> but they were so smart. <laughs> people. So I, w I was um, involved in the early days of the Santa Fe Institute. Mm -hmm. Where, and in fact, I, I wrote a grant proposal for them for a little mm -hmm. workshop on uh, uh, about complexity and complex systems, complex adapt adaptive systems. And to my surprise, surprise it became their, uh, their main theme for what they've been doing all these years. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it was quite interesting to, to hear Murray and the others talk about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're such smart guys. <laughs> yeah. I, I read uh, Feynman's biography or, or his yeah. autobiography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he was so clever. Yeah. He really was. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, they, I, I've learned however clever you think you are, there's always people who are a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So you, you mentioned you, you had a class with Shannon? And, yeah, and I, I took a course, three courses in information theory there. One was with uh, Robert Far Fano, who's still alive. Yes, I interviewed him actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then was uh, Peter Elias, who was mm -hmm. uh, uh, my advisor, and then was Claude. Yes. And uh, it was they were fascinating. Uh, Claude Shannon was really interesting. And, yeah. First time I met him was at a little uh, faculty student picnic in Arlington near uh, Boston. And he was out on the uh, little lake and he was walking uh, with a, lo a long, uh, a large piece of, uh, of wood floating on the surface. So he was walking on water, basically. And then the next thing I saw, he was riding on a unicycle. And, uh, and all so he had all kinds of interesting mm. hobbies and things like that. He was really a very unique person and very, very clever. And uh, I mean, it was, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have had a better um, um, uh, star than to uh, have uh, an education from Gabor, the inventor of holography, McCulloch and Pitts, who started automata theory, mm -hmm. Sha uh, Shannon, who started uh, information theory, and Wiener, who started cybernetics and uh, filtering all kinds of stuff. I mean, so uh, a few years ago, I gave a colloquium at M M MIT, and my uh, friend Tommy Pajo introduced me as one of the last living relics of the golden age of MIT, and uh, it was true. <laughs> it was the golden age. <laughs> People make a lot out of the golden age, like Woody Allen's movie Midnight in Paris, for example, is all about golden ages and the delusion that uh, life was always better in the past in a golden age. <laughs> but MIT was really something in the 50s and 60s. It still is, but it's very different from what it was then. When, when I interviewed Bob Kennedy, Bob Gallagher, Gallagher and Bob Farron, yeah, they, they, said, they said that Shannon almost never thought she must have been very lucky to well, to I, to I a took class. a class from him in 1959, uh, uh, I think. I, uh, he was yeah, still yeah. teaching then. You yeah. know, he unfortunately came down with uh, oh, yeah. early Alzheimer's uh, uh, s uh, symptoms. and uh, yeah. But that was after I left MIT. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he reportedly gave a class once, or a seminar series, where he introduce a new result at every lecture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were, were you there? Or you I think I it? was uh, there because okay. he was doing that kind yeah. of stuff then, yeah. And yeah, I, we, I used to spend Thursday afternoons going to his office for and talking with him for an hour or so. Mm -hmm. And one time he said to me, he said, um, he's starting to work on a, a model for two-way communication rather yeah. than one-way. And I said, uh, I'm, I've been thinking about that too, as a matter of fact. And he, he smiled at me. He thought I was a, a glib, <laughs> young whippersnapper. <laughs> but I mean, the thing I learned from all those people at MIT, McCulloch and Pitts and Wiener and Shannon and Marvin Minsky and Jerry Letvin and the others was uh, 
to really try to get to the essence of a problem. Same with Gabor and von Neumann and Vigo. No, and I, I used to um, belong to a group in that was uh, organized in Paris called the Institut de la Vie, which we used to refer to as the Institut de la Bonne Vie. <laughs> It was formed by a French anatomist called Maurice Marois and a, uh, a, uh, a refugee from uh, Austria and uh, Germany called Herbert Froehlich, who was one of the pioneers of the theory of superconductivity. They went to see a friend of um, Marois call, uh, called Pompidou, who happened to be the president of France at the time. And they said to him, life should be both studied and enjoyed. And they persuaded Pompidou to uh, um, assign a large amount of um, government money to set up a foundation for doing this. And the idea was they would have a, 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 a meeting every two years in the palace at Versailles entitled From Theoretical Physics to Biology. And the idea was that they would invite biologists to come and give talks and all the physicists and mathematicians in the audience would solve all the problems. Of course, it didn't work like that, but everybody had a very good time because the, um, the, the hotel where the, uh, it was used was the Trianon Palace Hotel. So I remember we used to take our meals in the room where the Treaty of Versailles was signed that essentially led to World War II. And uh, it was fascinating. The organizing committee was 40 people, of whom 32 were distinguished uh, Nobel laureates, and then there were, uh, was a group of eight younger people who actually did all the work for the meetings, and I was part of that eight. And uh, so I got to know all these uh, people like uh, uh, Robbie and Wigner and uh, all, all, everybody you can think of. And I learned just how smart some of these people really were. <laughs> it was really amazing. Yeah. The French mathematician René Tom was there. And he, I, I, I loved his work. <laughs> it was really interesting and unorthodox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jacques Monod and, and Changeur were there, and uh, Jaco and Monod. <laughs> I mean, Monod used to always try to provoke uh, discussions among various people. <laughs> I mean, he, he caused a real stir when he asked um, the audience, the people there, what they thought about the application of information theory to biology. You know? Triggered a riot. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I I learned that you know just how smart some of the some members of the science community really are, and it was always amazing. <laughs> I try. I, I, was, I got very friendly with a uh, a Polish uh, mathematician called Stan Ulam. Heard of him? Yes. And. Uh, uh, he was very interesting. He, I, we were traveling back in the plane from one of these meetings. He asked me what I was working on at the time, what I was doing. I was trying to work out a theory for the way in which um, um, the nervous system developed um, eye-brain connections in, 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 in animals like salamanders and, and frogs and fish. You, you can actually cut the optic nerve and rotate the eyeball in its socket by 180 degrees and put it back and it regenerates the connections. If you do that in a frog and you present an insect to the frog in its upper visual field, it will jump down rather than up because its wiring has been rotated, um, which proved that uh, there was specificity in the connections. Uh, Roger Sperry did a lot of the work on that, and uh, as well as work on split brains. And he got half of a Nobel Prize for his work. And Hubel and Wiesel got the other half for their studies on the way in which cats and primates detect edges in the visual field, uh, contours of uh, difference between light and dark, a contrast edge. And... Um, um, so Stan asked me what I was doing, and I started to describe the mathematical model I was constructing this. He said, I don't want to know about the mathematical model. Just tell me what it, how does it really work? And I learned a big lesson from that, from Stan. And, uh, yeah, he was a very interesting man. He, of course, worked with um, uh, Edward Teller in, on the Manhattan Project and on the Hydrogen Bomb Project. 
And he, he said to me once, he said, you know, uh, they call Edward the father of the hydrogen bomb. If he was the father, I was the mother. Because it was actually his idea that led to the uh, trigger mechanism for the, uh, for the uh, thermonuclear weapon. And he had mixed feelings about that, of course, but uh, he was actually the guy who did it. And, uh, and he also introduced what's called the Monte Carlo algorithm for using random processes to simulate things. De developed that in collaboration with John von Neumann and also with a uh, uh, University of Chicago colleague of mine, Nick Metropolis. And it's a very valuable piece of work. And, uh, and um, so <laughs> about three years ago, I gave a physics colloquium at Chicago. And after it, a student uh, came to me and said he would like to switch from the condensed matter physics group to working with me. I looked at him. And he looked very like the photographs I have of John von Neumann as a young man. And I said, what's your name? And he said, Jeremy Neumann. And it turned out he's a relative, a distant relative of John von Neumann. And he's proved to be one of my best ever students. <laughs> he's, uh, and um, it's one of the reasons I've, uh, I've stayed at the University of Chicago, which is not really a natural place for uh, someone with my interest to be. And the reason I've stayed there is because the quality of the graduate students is so high. It's an amazing place to have students. <laughs> I've been blessed with having such good students over the years. And you learn a lot from your students, actually. It's, it's, it's a two-way process. Uh, they learn and you, and you learn. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever, ever have definite laws of thought or definite equations on, on what's going on in the yes. brain? Yes, yeah. I think in principle, um, some, someone, some group will eventually understand uh, a great deal of uh, these things. Mm -hmm. It may be that there will be things that we'll never understand, but I doubt it. I don't think there's anything in the brain that we won't understand. But it may take um, a lot, lot longer. I mean, the experience of, of, of the artificial intelligence community is quite sobering. Uh, Fifty years ago, people thought that they were going to be able to solve problems like machine translation of language and uh, computer vision and stuff like that very quickly. And it, did, it turned out these problems are far, far more complicated than uh, the people originally thought. Yeah. The things that we t t take for granted are actually things that is very difficult, that are very difficult for machines uh, to do. Uh, and so there's a recent book by Walter Isaacson that I thought was very, very interesting called The, uh, the Inventors, I think, or something like It's all about the growth of... Uh, the internet and the modern world and everything. And uh, he, he, I think he, he's got the right idea. He said that in the early days, people didn't think about artificial intelligences as being autonomous robots, but as aids to humans. And he noted with, uh, that I thought was very interesting, he noted that um, all these um, big blue machines and the others that play chess, that um, it's true they've um, they've beaten humans to playing chess, but he said when you when you um, com you have a, a machine compete with a human who's aided by a machine, the human a plus um, artificial intelligence always seems to beat a machine work working on its own. That humans have the ability. Uh, to have insights and uh, original ideas and things like that that don't seem to be easily come by in, in uh, robots mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. And, I, and so he, he thinks the original sense that the early pioneers had that they, these machines would be aids to human uh, uh, understanding and, um, and uh, creativity rather than autonomous robots uh, still seems like the right way to go rather than the... Uh, 
the, so all these um, remarks by Hawking and others about how dangerous the world is going to be if robots become autonomous, truly, I think they're misplaced. I, I think uh, there'll be en enormous aids to humans, but I, I don't think it's going to go the other way. On the other hand, there are people in that community who believe that within 20 years they'll have solved <laughs> all the problems. Just having such a, a, a huge increase in computing power will, will dominate everything. But I, I think that's really misguided. Mm -hmm. But well, you never know. I mean, if 200 years ago, I think people then had absolutely no conception of what the world would be like now. And uh, 200 years from now, if the planet still exists uh, to support humans and, and other species, it will be very different from now. I mean, 50 years ago, it was a different it's world absolutely. altogether from now. When I, I, I used to lecture to undergraduates, I'm just finishing doing that. Um, I, I tried to explain to them that when I was their age, uh, there weren't any. There were just the beginnings of computers. There was no internet, no cell phones, uh, nothing like that. It was a different world altogether, and uh, there weren't any computers to to speak of. I mean, there were a few mechanical calculating machines and stuff like that. How people did what they did it was, it was it is amazing to me. All the, stuff that yeah. Turing did, for example, and yeah. all these people. <laughs> so could you reflect on, on, I mean, this is just a personal question, because what you mentioned about physics and theoretical physics, I'm, I'm trained as a pure mathematician, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm concerned when I see physics departments close. Yeah. I, I, uh, so is there a way to turn the tide? Because it's such an important subject, the theoretical physics. Um, well, or do you think it will naturally turn? <laughs> I don't think physics will, theoretical physics will go away. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There will always be people who, who do theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. They may not get uh, as well treated as, uh, as now, but the, the, uh, in the old days it was very hard to get money to do experiments. But of course it was much uh, more, you could get equipment much more cheaply in those days. and and so on, but um, there'll always be people I'm sure, sure, who yeah. do it. Yeah. I mean, look at Michael Faraday. He, he was totally untrained. Uh, he learned everything by trial and error and by doing experiments. He didn't ever understand mathematics because he had no edu formal education at all. He was completely an autodidact. He ended up uh, having a unique understanding of electricity and magnetism long, long before anybody else in the world. Uh, he didn't have the math, but Clark Maxwell had the math, and he put Faraday's ideas into mathematics mm -hmm. and produced Maxwell's equations. <laughs> but they really should have been labeled Faraday-Maxwell equations. Okay. And uh, there will always be people like that. Mm -hmm. Or Mendeleev, for example, with the periodic table, built it out of nowhere. <laughs> so I think the experimental was to do great stuff, but <laughs> Enrico Fermi, who was at Chicago for many years, unfortunately before I was there, he um, he said something that has always resonated with me. He said, uh, when experimental physicists um, uh, find something that's um, um, not predicted by theory, then it, it's a discovery. When they find something that is predicted by theory, it's a measurement. <laughs> and he was, I think he was a bit upset by all the Nobel Prizes that physicists got for measuring stuff that had been predicted by the theorists. <laughs> Is, is there anything in the interview that you feel we should have brought up that I, that I haven't broached? Um, well, it's hard for me to say. It all depends what your um, 
what you're interested in. <laughs> yeah, we're, well, we're, we're sort of tracing the Buller uh, influence and the Shannon connection as well. So. Well, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't myself have thought that there would be a direct connection between Buller and Shannon, except, of course, Shannon's early work when he was mm. a teenager was on uh, using uh, uh, switching circuits to embody Boolean algebra. And uh, I mean, it was a, it was a terrific piece of work. It was interesting, actually, that Shestakov in the Soviet Union in 1935 had actually thought up a very similar idea, but never published it. And it wasn't published until 1941 during World War mm -hmm. II. Yeah, but, um, it, it, I mean, it was the same idea, basically. And uh, it was quite, I mean, those days were very interesting, I think, the early days uh, with the development. Um, for example, Vannevar Bush developed the first analog computer in the United States, and then there was a similar um, development in Britain, in the United Kingdom, um, led by, um, uh, I think it was Hartree. Uh, and um, one of my early mentors, uh, Arthur Porter, he was involved in the b building the British equivalent of the, uh, of the Bush's analog computer. And uh, there was a lot of stuff going on there. Unfortunately, it seems to be a general principle that um, there's a tremendous um, acceleration in the development of, um, of um, all kinds of uh, science and mathematics during periods of war. War seems to be a great trigger for the development of technologies and uh, stuff. I mean, that ha certainly happened in World War One, and in World War Two. And it's ju it's just too bad that um, the general military um, personnel weren't as well educated in science and technology as they should have been, because they missed the lessons of um, the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, which was the first really modern war. Uh, fought with long-range artillery, and the, ca the the casualties in the Civil War in the United States were horrendous. Um, a, a large fraction of their population was killed because they just didn't understand the effects of machine guns and, th and art long-range artillery. And then the British Army failed to um, learn the lesson of that in the Boer War, and then the uh, uh, British Army still didn't learn the lesson until late on in World War One, and it wasn't until 1917 that they knew they shouldn't attack uh, face-on um, uh, uh, defended positions that were defended by machine guns and things. It was only tanks that saved the day, but again, that was a, an invention triggered by the war. And, uh, and um, I mean, all this, this, it's, um, I mean, Cooperation and competition are the two things that organize structures. And you see that in, in social human behavior all the time. And it's just too bad we're going through another one of these periods when uh, there's so much unrest that the conditions. Uh, I have a, a, a colleague who's from Biala, Russia. Rus he said the other month that, in his opinion, the conditions in the world are just like the conditions in the 1930s before the rise of the Nazis. And that's a scary thought. That, uh, and uh, um, so somehow the <laughs> uh, science and technology can, need to be able to work towards um, lowering the possibilities that there'll be these conflicts. You know, but uh, it's clear that uh, they've developed all kinds of uh, machinery using AI and all sorts of stuff as aids um, to uh, further uh, military uh, uh, stuff. Uh, there'll always be that aspect of human behavior, unfortunately. It's complicated, though. <laughs> it's all of these things are complexity of, uh, of um, interactions is the key that drove the Santa Fe Institute work. And it, uh, but it's very hard to um, make progress in that field. <laughs>
it's hard. And that's because there isn't enough deep mathematics in it. I think mathematics is the answer. And to the extent that Boole contributed to um, the development of, of uh, real mathematical ideas and the application of these to uh, the development of machines, I think uh, he and uh, Babbage mm -hmm. and uh, Lady uh, Lovelace and all those people from those days uh, were very, very important in the development of um, uh, all this stuff we do now. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome.